one of my most popular blog posts is actually about uh, hoisting in NPM. Hoisting, if you've never heard about it, is usually something you don't come across all that often unless you've worked in a monorail belt. And so hoisting is actually this concept that exists because of how node resolution works. And uh, so I want to take a kind of a deep look at what allows hoisting to even exist in the first place. And then let's take a look at how some of the different package managers out there handle and, and work with hoisting. Um, PNPM, for example, breaks hoisting completely. Whereas, you know, Yarn and NPM still use it out of the box if you're using Yarn workspaces and PM workspaces. I think it's a little different with plug and play. And then you'll also, we'll also take a look at how Yarn v3 introduced this concept of using a PNPM node linker to fix some of the hoisting problems too. So let's take a deep look at how all that works. So the very first thing we'll take a look at is the docs uh, from NPM or rather node on uh, node module resolution. So whenever you call require or you know import in case of using ES modules, all this stuff happens for you. And so when you require X, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to look and say, is X a core module? If it is, just return it and you're done. Uh, if it goes, if your require statement or import statement starts with a slash, we're going to look for, you know, the system root. That makes sense. If it begins with a dot slash or slash or dot dot slash, we'll call this load as a file thing. And so then it'll go and kind of say, hey, what's the file extension? If it's a JS file, load JavaScript text, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. If it begins with a hash sign, apparently there's something something there called load package imports, which I'd never even seen before, which is funny. Uh, load package self is, uh, I don't even know. I don't even know what that one is either. Uh, but the most interesting one is this uh, load node modules one. So what this one does is basically uh, it starts crawling your uh, file system. And, and if you think about it, it makes sense. When we go look in a minute, at, uh, at an example of, of a monorepo, it starts going down these node modules and it says, um, if there is node modules in this directory, let's start scanning it. And while it's, it's, it's just in this big while loop and it keeps crawling up the directory. So, uh, and looking for a node modules folder. So let's go take a look at NVS code at what that looks like in an NPM situation in Yarn. So I have this monorepo called pitfalls of hoisting. And actually this is a, uh, a monorepo of monorepos technically. Uh, and I used a tool that I po put on NPM called monogen. And uh, so basically you can, um, you can do NPX um, and you can do this thing called monogen. I'll get rid of the verbose flag, so I don't need that right now. Um, and uh, as of right now, it's just a small utility that I made, but it's kind of useful actually. You can run it, and then it'll ask you, you know, what what the name of your monorepo is, how many packages you want, um, what the scope of it is, what kind of monorepo it is. As of right now, it does yarn, npm, and pnpm, and then what directory to output it is. So I've done that a few different times for some different examples here. So let's start with uh, npm. And so in this monorepo, all I have is ten packages and. Uh, it's not doing much. It's not very exciting yet. But what's going on here is that React is is in this Kirby Apples invite npm demo package. And so when I came in to that packet to the npm hoisting example, and I ran my npm install, which I guess we can do again, even though I've already done it once. But uh, if I do npm i here, you'll see that it does it. It's good to go. And then we get a node modules directory at the root of our monorepo. And if you're in NPM, this probably makes sense to you already. Like, yes, of course, why would it not be there? But here's where things get interesting and why this is bad, okay? So if we take a uh, look at another package, uh, let's go into, well, let's just, let's just literally go to CD packages slash uh, Kirby ties John, actually. Let's look at this other one. So or, Kirby, is that what it says? Join, Kirby ties, Kirby ties, join. So Curry ties join has nothing in its package JSON file, right? It's empty. However, this thing up here has react. Here's what's interesting. If I come in here and I just type node, if I do require dot resolve react, what's going to happen? Oh, 
it finds it. That's not good. That means that anything in curvy ties join that wants to use React, any any index file, if we if we imported React from React in here, that would work. Uh, and and maybe that doesn't seem obvious why that's bad at first. Well, let's just say if, if you're in a monorepo and React is sort of a little bit of a convoluted example because it's sort of like almost a compiler at this point. But um, you know, not every monorepo on Earth uh, is stringent enough to say that you have to use one version of React throughout your project. And so let's just say that the team that maintains this application, you know, is actually needing React 17 or, or even, you know, you can think back in the day when we were on 16. And uh, if you went from like 16.4 to 16.8, like that was a big jump. And so there may have been teams, if you're in a big monorepo, there may have been a team that just wasn't ready to use 16.8 yet for whatever reason. So if that team had, for whatever reason, forgotten to add React into the package JSON, because of what we talked about a minute ago with that node module resolution, what it's going to do is it's going to start in you know this uh, folder here, and it's going to say, do I have a node modules directory in here? And it's going to be like, nope, don't have one there. So let's go up to the packages directory. Nope, no node modules folder in there. And then it's going to come up to the root, and it's going to find this node modules directory, and it's just going to use React. And uh, there you go. That's a problem right there. So uh, that is a problem that has sort of been coined as a phantom dependency. Okay. So that's the same, uh, and that's the reality both for NPM and for Yarn. Yarn both, Yarn NPM both, you know, they respect this workspaces thing, and they both do the same thing. So here's another example. It's the exact same problem. And so that's where hoisting will bite you uh, with those two kinds of repositories. So now let's take a look at what happens in a PNPM repo that uses symlinks. So if I come in and I do a PNPM install, P and I cannot type PNPM to save my life, PNPMI, uh, what it'll do is it has a, a different format for the lock file, which is super interesting, by the way. If you, if you never look at lock files, it's completely different than the NPM and Yarn one. Um, and there is still a node modules directory here, but what's different? This node modules directory has a .pnpm folder in it. And so if we go back and look at the npm one, all of those modules are, are here hoisted. And what's also interesting to call out is where we installed React here does not have a node modules directory in that package. And that's because this package is just using the one that's hoisted. The hoisted algorithm just makes it so that way, you know, when curvy apples invite, when its code looks for React, it just finds it in the root node modules directory. What's different about NPMs is if you go look at the same situation where this Big Impala stick has a React, what it does is this is a symlink. This re node module slash React here points directly to what's in this dot PNPM folder. And you'll see that we have an entry for React at 18.2.0. And so this actually is part of why NPM, PMPM is so much faster as well, because uh, all it does is creates that one flat folder of all your node modules and then just does symlinking to all of the um, different node modules directories across your monorepo. And so that is how hoisting is then broken, because unlike in the NPM example, if I was to now go into this 8apples report without a React, and try to require it or require resolve or import or anything from any code, it won't find it because it's not gonna go to the root node modules and find React. So that's how uh, things like PNPM and Yarn v4 with the NPM or the PNPM linking strategy. So there's another in this repo, I have another example where there is, um, you, can, you can actually tell Yarn now to, to use a PNPM like uh, node linker. And then it'll do the same thing. It puts it in a dot store, and then it has React dash npm 18.20, and then this hash kind of the content, which is useful for um, for in incremental installs. And then uh, also you can see the same situation where this this node modules React is just a symlink to what's in the store. So that's where hoisting is now broken, and uh, it, you have no more phantom dependencies and uh, no more doppelgangers, which is something didn't get around to, to mentioning yet, a doppelganger is similar to a phantom dependency, except it's basically like if I was to have 
you know, let's go in, let's actually just, you know, force it to happen here. So if for some reason I want to have, um, you know, a React that is 17 in here, oh, not, I need dependencies first. Um, so let's go in here and do um, React at 17 something, 17. I don't really care what version of 17, just 17 does zero zero. Let's go take a look in the NPM example about what happens there. Um, NPM hoisting rather is what the name of that is called. Let's run NPM install and watch what happens in this scenario. So now what happens is we do have a React here that is uh, not, uh, or that is different. This React is now 17.0.2, uh, but the root one is still going to be uh, the 18 point whatever one, uh, 18.2. And so this is, you know, combine that with phantom dependencies and you can wind up in a scenario where some package was thinking it was depending on, you know, the hoisted version, but then the hoisted version changes because hoisting the algorithm does weird things. All of a sudden it can just re-hoist something if, if the amount of people depending on a specific version of React changes, the hoisted one changes and then boom, you know, what you were depending on is then broken. And so that's this category called doppelgangers. So uh, long story short, if you can, I would recommend getting onto a package manager that does not do hoisting in the first place so that you don't have any of these weird issues at scale. Uh, so yeah, definitely go in and start investing in a, in a stricter package manager that does sim linking and breaks hoisting. Another pretty cool thing I want to make sure to talk about is that uh, on my team at Microsoft, one thing that we worked on uh, a few years ago, our monorepo was getting to be um, have some performance issues. And these performance issues were mostly stemming from some installation issues with Azure DevOps, like there were just some network issues. And at the time, uh, we were using Yarn, and uh, Yarn was not uh, doing stuff the way that uh, was working well with Azure DevOps. And so we decided to try to fix some of the network issues. And so we forked Yarn and made some pull requests back upstream. But at the time, it was right when Yarn v2 was coming out. And so they said, sorry, we're not doing contributions anymore to Yarn v1. And we were like, oh, no, now we're stuck with this thing to maintain uh, to maintain our package manager. And then later, it just kept getting worse. Like we fixed some of the network problems. But as the Monterey Pro kept growing, the package manager was just it was just crazy. And we tried to switch over to NPM, but there was a couple issues with lock file conflicts because of the way that the uh, lock file wasn't working at scale for us. And so we actually forked it again into something called Midgard Yarn Strip. And so this is something that's open source. It's a little bit out of date because we ended up pulling some of the source back inside temporarily. We're working on getting it back out. Uh, but uh, what happened here is Mikrod Yarn Strict is comprised of a few different libraries that uh, Vincent on, on our team decided to, to work on. And he learned how PNPM sort of worked and wrote a couple different interesting libraries that are linked here in the package JSON, local package store, no dependency graph, and ERAF. ERAF stands for Yarn Resolve and Fetch. So Midgard Yarn Strict more or less uses Yarn to download everything and then it runs everything through its our own graphing algorithm and then does uh, a pnpm like uh, install at the root of the repo uh, called uh, into the dot store folder and so it's really great and we're using it right now in our team and uh, this combined with some other awesome performance improvements has gotten us to the point where we're installing a mono repo of 2000 packages and like 15 million lines of code in like less than a minute in CI. It's kind of kind of wild. Um, but what's really interesting is that um, after we did a lot of this work, we paired with the NPM team and submitted an, an upstream RFC to implement something similar in, in NPM um, because of this work. Uh, it still doesn't help, it still doesn't beat us in terms of perf, but it's interesting that, PNP, that NPM also does have a linked install strategy as well. So uh, if you do npm i dash dash strategy equal install strategy linked, the example I talked about a few minutes ago will actually be not hoisting. It's still experimental and still being worked on though. So uh, your mileage may vary there, uh, but uh, you can use that as well. It's just really cool. We're, we're trying to figure out kind of how to take what we've done with the mega darn trick stuff um, back out. We're still using it as of right now. 
Um, and it does solve a lot of our problems and it's really, really fast. So like we're hoping to try to share more of that knowledge. Um, I think we actually did share a pretty cool yarn caching uh, thing that we did with the PNPM team. And there's actually a GitHub uh, issue there. Um, let's see if I can track it down real quick. I think it was um, PNPM uh, memory cache, or maybe David Michonne. And I think it was him that did it on our side. So we've been able to help, you know, kind of NPI here, CI installation performance. So this work um, we shared with our OneDrive SharePoint team, this memory cache stuff. And we were able to get that, um, you know, help them out over there too on PNPM. So it's been kind of fun, you know, to have our own package manager and be able to contribute upstream. Eventually we may, you know, either make Midgard or Strict, um, you know, even more public source or, you know, get on to something else, but it's been kind of fun to be able to, you know, learn about all this hoisting stuff and, uh, and how, um, work with Migrate Darn Strict, learn how all this, you know, I've never built and, and like looked at the innards of a package manager before, but because of all that, that's why I've been able to learn about all this hoisting and, uh, explain it. And I'm, I'm hoping to share this, you know, all over the place. Cause it's not, again, hoisting is not something you come across a ton. Uh, and it's kind of confusing. So hopefully all of this was useful and helpful if you're in a monorepo. And even if you're not, I mean, the thing is like, you still should make sure that you declare your dependencies well in your repo because you don't, you never know if somebody's going to import your uh, package into um, another monorepo and you forgot to declare, you know, I think the interesting scenario is if, if you had a package that, uh, you know, had a, had a phantom dependency of its own uh, that got installed, you can break someone else upstream. So just be a good citizen of the open source and make sure you declare all your dependencies. And uh, and uh, there you go. That's, uh, that's hoisting in a box. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on all the networks and everything, read the blog or whatever if you want to talk more. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy.